I'm going to go through what we're going to be doing with this unit on political science and uh, try to give you some idea of where we're going with it, what we're going to try to accomplish, and what the issues are going to be. Um, now, one of the things I spelled out in the um, course introduction video on the syllabus is that when we go through these different topic areas, the political science, economics, science, and um, uh, religious studies, we're going to be approaching each topic in an academic manner. Okay, so with political science, what we won't be doing is discussing, say, contemporary American politics. Is this politician right? Is that one corrupt? Or that kind of thing. We won't be doing that or going into contemporary political issues. Um, this certainly does have carryover to understand the nature of those debates that go on today, but we don't want to get mired down in those issues. Instead, with political science, I want to take a step back and try to understand how the field works. When you go into a political science classroom, what is the nature of the discussions? How are they going to be looking at things? Um, where, do they see, where do they see the important issues and the less important issues? And also be aware that there are many you know, uh, popular debates over politics, and this is what we see a lot on the, you know, the Sunday morning talk shows and things like that. Um, that's not what we're going to be doing so much. We're going to be going a little bit deeper um, and really into um, a term I want to introduce, ideology, which is a term most of you have heard, um, and it seems to be used like a throwaway term, something's ideological, it's um, just abstract and not worth discussing. In a political science environment, it's extremely important to understand it because it sets the foundation for all the discussions that come after it. Okay? Um, so let me start in on this, and this is what we're going to be doing with this unit, and this is how we want to be aware of things and what we want to be looking for in the readings. Um, these issues will come up. They won't be simple. They're going to be quite um, uh, you know, intricate and sophisticated, um, but you're going to see them play out um, in reading after reading after reading. Okay? So with ideology, how a political scientist will see it is that it's a core value. It's regarding your core values um, regarding politics, economics, society, and religion. These go deeper than, say, a party affiliation. They go much deeper. Everybody, everybody over the age of, say, 10 years old, even I would say 10-year-olds probably, has an ideology. I know a lot of people like to think that they are open-minded or they're open to you know, different ideas or that they're not ideological. Everybody is because everybody has a political value or excuse me, a core value system regarding politics. An obvious one, for example, is do you think we should have a president or an emperor? Okay. Should the military run the government or should the people elect the government? Should it be run by a religious group? automatically you probably had responses to this and I want to be very clear there's actually no right or wrong answer to any of those questions there really isn't okay um, most Americans would say that you should we should have a president and it, um, he or she should be elected most Americans that's part of their ideology they believe in a representative form of democracy most Americans not all um, and again I want to be very clear there's not a right and wrong it's understanding the value system behind it. In economics, it's understanding what kind of economic approach um, the country as a whole should be using. Um, should you have an absolute free market to everything? Um, many people do argue for this. Or should there be kind of a balance in between? Okay? Um, or should you have a centralized control of um, all market economies, of all economic, of all economic trades, by a centralized authority. Okay? Um, often, for example, if we did you know, a free market society, should police only be for those folks who can afford it? Um, in that case, most people say no, that should be you know, centralized with the government. Most people would say that. And again, you could say anything you want, but it's important to know what your economic system is and what your economic values are. Should the government be responsible for running restaurants? Should um, we have a free market military where people only you know, go into the military if they're paid according to the highest bidder? Um, those are economic values. And in certain situations, most people say centralized in one and non-centralized in the other. Okay? 
and I'll come back to this. What about society as a whole? Okay. Um, should people be trusted and can they be um, relied upon or do they need more control in their lives? Um, should they be allowed to do certain things? Should they not be allowed to do certain things? Um, how many laws should you have regarding how many things? Um, what should you be able to do with your computer? You know, those types of ideas come up and that's how we see society and how much government intervention there should be or should not be. Okay? And then religion. Should religion take a, uh, play a part in government? Um, if so, which one? If not, how will it relate to society? Should government actually get rid of religion? Um, many states have done that, have tried to do that. Um, or should um, religious groups be able to petition the government or not petition the government? Or how should they be involved in the organizing of society? Okay? On all of those issues, everybody has a certain type of response. It's part of their core values. Part of your core values on it. Now get to understanding this, and it's very important when you're discussing politics, it's not just about do you like this politician or not like this politician, or do you vote according to this party or not that party. It's about understanding somebody's core values um, as you go through the discussion, as you go through um, the reflection on what's being discussed here or what's being um, uh, covered. And it's going to get to that core values regarding these basic areas. Okay? So, to get to ideology and understand the core ideologies, you have to look at basic assumptions. Basic assumptions that guide this. The first one to look at, and I'm going to go through two for this class, and these are the two big ones. Human nature. What do you think about human nature in political um, arenas, economic arenas, society, and uh, religious arenas? What do you think about human nature? Are humans essentially good or essentially evil? Are they going to be doing the right thing and what's appropriate, or are they going to be more destructive? Okay? And I know that's a question where it's, well, maybe yes, maybe no, but in this case, it's very hard to sit on the fence. You have to kind of pick a side because it's going to affect how you see political power being used in that circumstance. And you can't really sit on the fence with it. You have to decide because there has to be some kind of institutional response or no institutional response depending on how you answer this. If people can be trusted, you're going to get one type of response. If they cannot be trusted and they're going to be destructive or evil, then you need a different kind of response. And that second part of it is how political power is used. Should it be centralized around a central figure or institution or should it be decentralized in this circumstance and people are allowed to do their own darn thing? So, if you have it centralized, what you are saying is, if you're going to have a centralized authority, you are saying that people cannot be trusted in this circumstance. That they cannot be trusted to handle this situation. Instead, we need a ground rule, our ground rules set, and we need one authority figure running this show. Okay? If you're going to assume that people are essentially good, they probably don't need somebody else telling them what to do or laws regulating their behaviors. They probably don't need that because they can be led to do their own darn thing. Then you're going to have an approach to power that is decentralized. In other words, you're not going to put um, a single institution or a single person in charge of running this issue. Okay? So under this cir these circumstances, you're not going to have one person running it, or one set of rules, or one institution. That's a more um, you know, centralized approach, is a one set of rules, one institution, one person. The decentralized is you're not going to have it. Okay? But you'll notice you have to answer that question first. Are people essentially good, or are they essentially evil? And your response to that question is going to lead up to how you resolve the basic issue. Are you going to have a centralized figure running it with a set of laws or a centralized institution or are you just going to leave people alone and let them run their own darn show? Okay? Um, and how you define liberal and conservative in political science comes back to these basic assumptions. Okay? Comes back to that. And one thing I want to be very, very clear about, how political scientists see liberal and conservative is quite different than how people define these terms 
in today's political environment. Now, I'm imagining that most of you in this class are probably under 30. Some of you may not be, but anybody who's been around for more than three decades knows that the nature of liberal and conservative in um, contemporary discourse changes over time. Um, many issues that were seen as being liberal have become conservative. Many that were seen as conservative have become liberal. Um, many people may or may not know there were movements amongst some conservatives before to actually reform health care, but then health care became more of a liberal issue. Um, so these issues often flip. So political scientists use terminology um, about liberal and conservative that's more consistent that's not going to change with each new generation. So that political scientist can look back two centuries, three centuries, ten centuries, and actually figure out, is this person, is this writer, is this um, institution a more liberal one or a more conservative one? And they can discuss it because they can understand, are these people making the assumption that people are essentially good or evil? Do they have a more centralized or a decentralized institution or um, uh, political structure running this um, show, okay? So liberal and conservative in political science, um, a liberal will start with the assumption that people are essentially good in this situation. That they can be trusted to run their own show, they know what they're doing under these circumstances, they should be left alone. Um, that is a decentralized approach to that, um, uh, to ideology or into government and government power, okay? It's decentralized. We're not going to have a centralized authority telling people what to do in this situation. Um, conservative starts with the assumption that essentially people are destructive or bad. They are going to create anarchy if you leave them alone and become selfish, destructive individuals under these circumstances. Therefore, you need a centralized authority that follows some kind of codified um, set of rules, some kind of laws, or you need a centralized institution um, that runs the show, okay? Um, so that's how the terms are used in political science. They, may, they work with these uh, assumptions about human nature in these different arenas, and they have responses. Um, and again, individual responses, you can have different types of centralized authorities, and you can have different approaches to decentralizing authority um, in political issues, economics, uh, social and religious issues. You can do centralized or decentralized in different ways, but you want to look at, are the, is their approach basically centralized, and does it assume that people are, uh, just can't be trusted, they're evil? Um, or is it decentralized and it assumes that people are basically good? That's what you need to be able to do in a political science context. Okay? So, just a few examples, and again, I don't want to get into contemporary politics much, um, and I really, I don't want the discussion board going into political, um, into current political issues. I'd like that to be avoided because that can get distract, um, become distracting from the readings. I'd like all the discussions to focus on the Lao Tse, on the Plato, on the Machiavelli, and the Wollstonecraft. Okay? Um, focused on those. But just so you can see some of these issues, um, how they do play out to a political scientist in contemporary politics, um, we do have, say, um, in a political values, we have a somewhat mixed liberal and conservative um, system and that, yes, we do have, we put a lot of trust in individuals to choose the president, the Congress, and the senators, um, but we do have a conservative element to it. We have a liberal element in that we do believe that people should vote. And most Americans do believe that even if they lose the election, that the other person should take office. So in other words, if you looked at, say, the um, 2004 election where John Kerry and George Bush were running against each other, um, most Democrats would say, well, George Bush won the election, therefore he should be president. And if you look at the 2008, 2012, well, most uh, conservatives and Republicans would look at the election and say, well, Obama won the election, therefore he should be president, not John McCain. Um, you know, in 2008, um, or Romney in 2012. That's actually a liberal value according to the political system, but the political system itself is more centralized and that the president does get a set number of years. He has a centralized authority. But you'll notice if you look at our constitution, it does have a balance of power. So it is a more liberal approach to government 
than, say, having a king or an emperor or somebody else who rules for life. Okay? An economic system, Americans have kind of an, a mixed system where we do have certain parts of our economy that are centralized and certain parts are decentralized. Um, I did mention, for example, where you get lunch. You know, if you go to a restaurant, the government doesn't run that. It regulates it somewhat, makes sure the food's clean and things like that. But overall, whether or not a restaurant opens on that street corner is up to the restaurant. That's a decentralized approach. But in certain other areas, such as police work, we have a centralized, um, you don't pay for, if you have to call the police if there's a robbery at your house, you don't call the police and they show up and run your credit card. They don't do that. That would be a decentralized approach. That has been done in certain societies. Um, fire departments also. Okay? Um, the richest man in Rome was a gentleman by the name of Crassus, um, and he got so wealthy because he ran the fire department. Um, you had to pay him to put out your fire. So you can do that. Most Americans don't believe in that. They would believe in it should be centralized. That's how you can see it play out in different issues. If you look at, for example, um, gun control, and again, I won't give my view on it, and I don't want the discussion at the board to go into it, um, believe it or not, compared to, say, Europe and other um, industrialized nations, we actually have a much more liberal approach to gun ownership because we do, and legally speaking, um, allow more people to own guns and think that they can handle them. That is actually contrary to how our current political discussions go, where we do, where people, if they call themselves liberal on gun control, would be for more gun control. People that call themselves uh, conservative actually would be for less gun control, but actually for a political scientist, the terms would be reversed. Liberal, remember, you are assuming that people are essentially good, and if you take up the gun issue, they know how to handle the gun, and you should not have the government stepping into it. You're actually a conservative on gun control in these terms, in a political scientist's approach. If you think there will be more destruction from gun ownership, and you do think there should be a centralized authority with you know, a set of laws to actually regulate this um, uh, activity. So that's how you can understand it, and how political scientists will look at situations like that. Okay? And again, I want you to notice I don't give you my personal opinion, but I can show you how things work using the tools of political science. Um, so you have an idea of how we're going to approach it and how it's seen through the um, eyes of a political scientist. Now what we have here in this selection of readings are four of the probably the most important political scientists who have written in uh, history. And again, I, I do stick with older writers. Um, Lao Tzu is the first one. Um, and he's coming from Asia, writing um, from a Chinese background. Um, we don't know much about him, and I will go um, into this in much more detail when I get to the Lao Tzu video. But I do want to tell you a little bit about him before you get too far into it and too far into the discussion. Um, and this is a selection from the Tao Te King or the Tao and its characteristics. Um, I pronounce it Lao Tzu. Um, you will often see different names, different spellings, and other things. There are a number of problems with the text. It's been handed down after generation after generation and generation and generation. If you look into his background at all, which I, you know, I wouldn't actually recommend, you'll know that we don't know who actually was Lao Tzu. And you'll find out very quickly that we, he may not even have existed. Um, he may just be a figure whom people just slapped a bunch of ideas onto and said, this is Lao Tzu. Um, almost all texts before the year 1000 have this problem. Almost all do. Um, but, and I'll go more into that when I get to the Lao Tzu one. But what this does reflect are many of the political values that were being handed down at the time. Um, the problems with the textual um, integrity aside, um, which I will mention as I go through it in a little more detail, um, it does reflect the value systems that were being handed down under the name of this figure. Okay? And then what you get when you get to the actual reading itself is you get two basic parts and a um, little over 80 some odd little sentences or little sections that go into political ideas. Some of them are, well, most, I'd say about half of them are quite odd to the modern Americans reading it. Um, you get the starting of, on chapter one, the town that cannot be trodden is not the enduring and unchanging town. The name that, cannot, um, that can be named is not the enduring and unchanging name. 
you're going to see a lot of sentences like that where you read it and you're going to go, oh my God, what the heck is he writing about there? I have no idea. Um, and why would Mr. Pendleton make me read this? Um, what I'll say is, well, um, it's an important text, that's number one. And what I'll say is also as you go through it and you develop a better understanding of it, then you're going to see why. It takes a little bit of time and it's going to ask a good deal of your patience to get through it. Also understand there are going to be many things in here. Even if you write on this for your essay and you study it like crazy, you're just not going to understand and you're not going to be sure. <clears throat> and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. If you hit some sentences in here that you just don't understand, that's okay. Um, some of them I will stop when I go through the Tao, um, when I go through Lao Tzu and I go through the Tao. I will go through the most important ones and explain them to you, but many of these you just might not understand, and that's okay. So be patient with it, go through it, try to identify when the writer is assuming that people are essentially good, or when the writer is, essentially, uh, is assuming that people are essentially evil. <clears throat> When is he arguing for a more centralized approach to a different issue? When is it a more decentralized? He changes it throughout. And I, I will warn you with these readings, it never falls into nice, clear-cut categories. There's usually a little bit of ambigu ambi ambiguity here and there. Okay? So as you go through it, do your best. Make sense of it as best you can. Write your summary. It should be, if you had to measure it out, and again, I don't want you to worry about whether or not everything's spelled correctly, the commas are there. Try to cover the reading as best you can. And I will urge you not to default to going to Wikipedia to see what it's really about. Make sense out of it yourself. You will not be counted as wrong if you go through it, do your best, misunderstand it, but do your best. That's what you're looking for. That's part of the process of learning. So don't default to Wikipedia. I wouldn't even bother with it. You can go there. It's perfectly fine. Um, but I would urge you instead, better use of your time, Work through it, make the best sense of it you can, and then write up your summary of it. Summarize you know, what you can, about one or two things per page is what you should try to get, um, and do the best you can throughout it, and then I'm going to be posting the video um, right after we're done with the um, discussion. Okay? Take care. Good luck with this.